all hell breaks loose in your life and everything gets broken and you have to hit the reset button, how do we make sure the next time won't be like the last time? If you have to start over, you want to make sure you get it right, right? You do. Don't keep making the same mistakes over and over again. And that's what this series is all about. And that's what we've been talking about. We're going to nail it down a little bit tighter today. There are three things that you've got to do to make sure the next time won't be like the last time. Last week, Josh told you about the first one. He said in order to reset successfully, you absolutely, positively have to own it. You have to own your part of the flop, the failure, the fumble. Regardless of what it was, you have to own it. Tell somebody you need to own it. Why continue to blame somebody else? Why continue to blame someone else? For the life of me, I cannot figure out why you would want to sweep your part under the rug and smuggle your addictions, your insecurities, your dysfunction, all of those issues, you know we could go on and on and on, into your own future. Why pack all that stuff up and take it with you? That's what blame shifting does. It, 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 it keeps all those insecurities in your own house. Why hide your responsibility from the last failure and smuggle into your future the things that sabotaged your past? Own it, fix it, okay? That's the first step. Here's the second that we're going to zero in on and talk about today. If you want to make sure the next time won't be like the last time, you need to rethink everything. You need to rethink it. Let, let me explain that. We're going to break this down for you. The relationship collapses, reset. Your financial status is tossed on its head, reset. Your professional career just got canned, reset. You flunked out and lost your academic scholarship after your very first semester, reset. Somebody who loves you is standing in the wings and they're watching all this stuff play out and they're watching it all go down, and when it's finally over, and you're able to look back on it and reflect, you know, they kind of step up, and they ask you some, some tough questions. They go, why did you do that? Or what caused you to make a decision, a really dumb decision like that? When you have time to reflect, when the emotional trauma of the circumstance has finally settled down, and, and you're starting to regain your composure emotionally, you're going to concede to that failure by saying something like this, I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know what I was thinking. Everybody tried to warn me. They told me he was a womanizer. They told me she was a psycho. But I loved her. I loved her. What was I thinking? No money down, 0% interest, 950 payments. Everybody said, don't do it, don't do it, you'll be sorry. But I thought, this will make me happy. I'll finally be satisfied. What was I thinking? What was I thinking? Listen, when the dust finally settles, when your, emotions, when your emotions finally return to some semblance of normalcy, when you say to yourself, what was I thinking, don't just you know, make it a statement. You need to genuinely embrace it as a question, and you need to take the time to answer that question. You need to take the time to address it and answer the question. Don't move on without answering the question, what was I thinking? If you don't figure that out, if you don't figure that out, you're destined to repeat the mistakes of your past over and over and over again. Take some time to rethink it, okay? Now, if you just sort of throw it out there like a confession instead of a question, if you don't rethink it, I promise you, you are destined to travel the highway to hell all over again, and it's going to be a painful road. What was I thinking? Ooh, she's so fine. What was I thinking? No money down. Really, that's me. What was I thinking? How much an hour? Yeah, I'll take that job. What was I thinking? 50% off. Let's go shopping. You better figure out the last one before you move on to the next one. Just asking the question is not the solution. What was I thinking? You need to answer the question. That's the key to making sure the next time won't be like the last time. Now, here's what I know and here's what you know. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. I don't know that that's great English and, you know, that's kind of what you've come to expect from me, but it's just that simple. If you don't fix your broken thinker, get ready for another stinker. That's going to be a horrible t-shirt, but we just might do it. If you're not a Christian, let me, let me address you guys in the room because we have a lot of people that kind of are leaning into faith and checking things out. If you're not a believer, we're glad you're here. We're excited that you came today. 
Uh, maybe, you know, the Bible is not your thing or the whole Jesus thing is kind of something you're just checking out. You're not really sure about all that history. But look, you're about to hear a lot of common sense type stuff. And I want you to understand, if you're not careful, you'll catch yourself nodding your head and you're going to be going, that makes sense, that makes sense. And it's okay that you're here and you're not fully in or that you're not a believer and you're just checking things out. But there's a lot of common sense stuff you're going to hear that's going to really touch you. And, and it's okay for you to embrace some of the principles that we're going to talk about, okay? That's important. But for those of you who lean into the timeless teachings of Scripture, uh, let's take a look at Romans, which is the letter the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome. And while I don't have time to uh, give you a lot of history, and that's what the, the book of Romans is, it's actually a, a historical document, and we've talked about that a whole lot. The Apostle Paul was somebody who understood the importance of pushing the reset button and starting over again, starting fresh. And Paul dealt with a lot of shame and guilt in the life that he lived uh, before was not a, a great thing he wanted to talk about. And he had to, he had to reset he, because he, he was known to be a guy that did some horrible things. In fact, he was the guy that was doing everything within his power to stop the movement called Christianity. He was known for persecuting Christians. He threw many Christians in prison. In fact, his hands were stained with blood of believers because he was trying so vehemently to pause the, the action and the movement of the first century church. But the thing is... It, it eventually caught him. It eventually changed him. He eventually had to reset his whole life because he became a believer. So when he became a believer, there was a massive reset in his life. There was a lot of tension in his life because of his past. So let's, let's read the scripture that we're going to talk about. Let's look at it through Paul's eyes as a guy that, that's famously known to have pushed the reset button that I've been trying to help you guys get to. Here's what he said in Romans 12, and, and this is how we'll break this down. He said, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. First of all, he's talking to Christian people. So again, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, it's okay for you to kind of check out on this if you want to. I'm asking you to lean in and just kind of absorb some of the life principles we're going to talk about. I'm inviting you to do that, but you certainly don't have to. But Christian folk in the room, you need to lean in and you need to pay attention. Paul said, hey, I urge you. I'm urging you, pay attention, lean in and get some of this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, a sacrifice 2,000 years ago was something totally different than what we think about today. Metaphorically, you know, we go, oh, I'll sacrifice and give a little offering, or I'll sacrifice and, you know, give a little time down to, in, in as much ministries, or I'll sacrifice and I'll do a little something here to help somebody. When he said, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to his audience that day, those guys were visualizing the animal sacrifices on the altars that were the atonement for their sins. They're seeing the blood and the gore and all this stuff, and that was the visualization that they had. So he continues, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Now that analogy again was a bit extreme, so he breaks this down so that even 21st century cross-pointers gathered together on Earth Day in this building can get it, and this is absolutely great. Here's how he defined it in a practical way so we can understand it 2,000 years later. He said, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Don't be like everybody else. Their lives are so predictable. He said, the majority of people, you know what kind of lives they're going to live. There's broken relationships. Everybody does that. Broken trust. Everybody does that. Broken bank accounts. They all are living that way. Busted lives. Unhappy homes. He said, don't be like everybody else. You don't have to be like everybody else. The majority of people conform, he says. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Don't be like the majority. In other words, don't be like this guy. You know, there's another one, there's another one, and we're all just conforming. We're just cookie-cutter Christians, and we're all just living the same kind of lives and doing the same kind of things and putting up with the same kind of chaos in our lives. He says, don't be like this little guy. This little guy is not what God created you to be. It's not who he created you to be. Don't do that. He says, he goes on, he says, but be transformed. He says, I want you to be different. I want you to be transformed. Another way of saying this is don't be like this little guy. <laughs> Lennox hit the jackpot today. You hear what I'm talking about? Sermon illustrations just got real good for Linux. Now, I understand. Somebody called me out and said, Pastor, that's not a transformer. That's a Power Ranger. For today, it's a transformer. Okay, it's a transformer. Just, just go with it. You get it right. Okay. He says, don't be like the little guy. Be like this guy. A transformer. Everybody say transformer. Don't say Power Ranger. Say transformer. 
There we go. He's wanting you to understand this is an important thing. Don't be a clone of everybody else's poor choices and bad decisions. Don't conform to mediocrity. He said, don't be a conformer, be a transformer. Why be like everybody else when you can be uniquely who God created you to be? I didn't share this in the first service because I didn't think I was going to have time. So I want to tell you a quick story. Sylvia and I have spent a lot of time in, in nursing homes late, lately, assisted living facilities. And we've gone down with, you know, uh, family to, to the dinner, the dining hall, and all this kind of stuff. And so it's been a while back, but we were walking through and there were some people that were really kind of angry, some of the older guys that were there. They weren't happy to be there. They're just kind of angry and bitter. And I noticed that. And uh, I said, man, some of these guys are a little rough around the edges. You know, they're a little angry. And uh, she says, and if you don't behave yourself, this is where your kids are going to put you. <laughs> you know? And I come home, and I did a little investigative you know, work, and I found out that Micah has already called these people across the street that's building this new place, and they're not even open yet, okay? And, and so I'm envisioning this in my mind, you know, because someday the sun's going to set on us, and we're going to, you know, go somewhere else, and, and let's just say I end up in a place like that because I've just conformed, and I'm angry like a whole lot of other people. And I, I, I've been picking at Marissa. I said, I'm going to come across the street every day just to aggravate you. And I'm going to knock on the glass, and, and she's going to have the doors locked because she'll figure out she needs to do that, you know, kind of keep me out. And I'm going to knock on the door, and she's going to come, and she's going to say, Daddy, you're not getting in today. You go back across the street, and you play checkers with all the other mean, angry old men, you know. <laughs> because the problem comes in when we just conform to be like the rest of the world, unhappy, miserable, and allow circumstances to get out of our control and spin out of our control, and then we just are trying to survive instead of thriving. And there's a problem with that. There's a serious problem. Paul goes on and he says, Do you want me to tell you how to be a transformer? Yes, Paul, please. By the renewing of your mind, he says that we must present our bodies as a living sacrifice, but in order for your bodies to actually do the things a living sacrifice needs to do, you need to make some changes. You've got you to pay attention to what you were thinking when you look back and you ask yourself the question, What was I thinking? You need to pause. You need to slow down, and you need to take time to answer the question. You're, you're, you're not going to be transformed by simply asking the question. You've got to figure out the answer to the question. So to renew, it actually means to restore it. It means to reset, which is what we've been talking about. Uh, when I was a, a kid growing up in my, my dad's home, my dad was a paint and body guy. He worked for Lincoln Mercury Company, and he, he was the, over all their paint and body shop. And so we grew up with a paint booth out behind our house. Whenever he would get a chance, he would do work on the side, and he would paint cars for church folks and all that kind of stuff. He was a bivocational pastor. So I grew up sanding down cars, taping cars. Every now and then he'd let me spray the bed of an old truck or something like that, you know, just to kind of get a little experience. But a couple of things that I really hated, I hated sanding door jams and preparing door jams. And I hated uh, sanding and preparing under hoods and under trunks because it was meticulous work, and it just took forever to, to you know, cover every inch of that space. It was sometimes really hard to get to. And so there were a few times I decided to cut a few corners. And I remember the first time, I remember the first time we, he was painting a car for one of the deacons in the church. Don't ever do no work for deacons. <laughs> but he was painting the cars for a deacon, and, and uh, I decided I didn't want to sand them door door jams. I just wanted to make it look like I sanded the door jams. So sure enough, several months later, Brother Deacon comes back to my dad. He said, hey, my doors are peeling. My door jams are peeling. And you know what daddy did? He came to me and said, boy, what'd you do? And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, just playing dumb. He knew what I'd done. My daddy used to say this. And he just drove this home. He'd say, son, it's a lot easier to do it right the first time than to have to go back and try to fix something after you're supposed to have done it right. Now, that's some of the best advice you'll ever get in life. Don't cut corners. Don't get in a hurry. Let's do this right so that the next time can be better than the last time. Are you tracking? You with me? It's going to get close in here. It's going to get a little tight. It's going to be tight, but it's right. You ready? I'm telling you the reason that your next relationship peels, the reason your next job peels, the reason that the next college major peels, your next big purchase painfully peels is because you asked the question, what was I thinking, but you didn't take time to answer the question. 
You didn't take time to figure out what went wrong the last time so that you didn't repeat the mistakes the next time. You can't change your thinking until you fix what feeds your thinking. You know why a lot of people don't like to answer that question? Because it takes time. It takes time. It's frustrating, like sanding door jams or trunk lids. So we tend to say, just throw a new coat of paint on it. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. It'll look good. You know, just throw a new coat of paint on it. But it never is fine. It covers up a whole lot of stuff for a little while, but it always resurfaces. If you don't take off the old, the new has a tendency to just peel right away. The Apostle Paul says, look, if you want to be transformed, it's not simply a matter of the will. It's not simply a matter of discipline. You have to renew, restore, reset your mind. Your thinker has got to be fixed. It's pretty exciting for me, it, you know, as a pastor. I've never been in the waters that we're in right now, so to speak, to, to lead a growing congregation, a vibrant church, a church on the move like Cross Point. Little things that I used to take for granted have become frustrations for me as I get a little bit older. Like, I used to could remember everybody's names. You know, I mean, when we had 150, 200 people, even 300 people, I pretty much had everybody's name. I, I, I had it. It stayed with me. I could call everybody by name. But after about 300 folks, it started getting harder for me to remember people at 800 and even on up 1,000 sometimes. It's impossible for me to remember names. And I blame aspartame. I, I just found out <laughs> that that's probably what's doing it to me, so we'll cut back on that. But for every person, here's my point, for every person that walks through our doors that drives under our cross, there's a story represented in their life. Something, there's a story. I may not ever have time to listen to all of them, but there's a story there. And there's generally a story that involves a, a lot of heartache, a lot of pain, broken hearts, hurt feelings, devastating losses. And I've watched so many of you navigate through those tough, tough roads, potholes, washouts, broken bridges, barricades, detours. But the road called broken relationships is the one that is the most common, most commonly traveled by cross pointers, okay? at least in my assessment. I talked about this a few months ago, and I talk about it a couple of times a year because a lot of people here experience broken relationships. And I noticed that one of the big mistakes that was being made, and, you know, I've never called anybody on it. If they come and ask me my opinion, I'm certainly going to give it to them. Uh, but I noticed that they were getting out of one horrific relationship and rushing right into the next one. And I'm like, doggone, you need to slow this train down. You know, I hate to see this happen, and... Because, because, you know, they weren't taking the time to ask and answer the question, what was I thinking the last time around? Instead, they were just slapping on a new coat of paint and smuggling all the old stuff right into that new relationship. And it breaks my heart because I know eventually it's going to break yours. It's going to start peeling and flaking off just like the last one did. And I was talking with our pastors recently, and we were sitting there, and I was kind of going over some scenarios and... And uh, we were just getting feedback and sharing with one another. And I asked them their opinion on this. And here's the thing. Statistics have shown us that in the U.S., 50% of first marriages, 67% of second marriages, and 73% of third marriages end in divorce. The scale just keeps getting higher and higher. Studies reveal one of the key factors is people tend to avoid personal responsibility for their part in the breakdown and blame their former spouse for the broken relationships. Therefore, they continue to function with their own dysfunction in the next relationship, having never taken time to deal with their own personal issues. They just kind of pack it all up and smuggle it into the house of their next relationship. Psychiatrists and counselors call this unfinished business. Listen to me, cross pointers. Before you put on a new coat of paint, you better properly prepare the old surface and get it ready for the restoration, the renewal, and the reset. Now, if you don't, there's about a 67% chance it's going to peel it again, just like the last one. And if you put on another coat of paint on top of that, according to statistics, there's about a 73% chance that one's going to peel too. It's just really hard for us to agree. It, I know it's going to get quiet in here, but I, let me go all the way through this and you'll be okay. It's really hard for us to agree to do your wedding ceremony when your divorce is not even final yet from your last marriage. You hear what I'm saying? You need to slow this train down and ask the question, what was I thinking? And take time to answer the question. What was I thinking? Take some time. Renew it, restore it, reset it the right way so that the next time is not like the last time. 
We're trying to make sure that the next time is not like the last time. And you ought not be angry at us for that. You ought to love us for that. We're not trying to hurt you. We're trying to help you. Don't, don't be like the majority. 73, 67. Don't be like the majority. You know, and here it is. See my bald spot? I told him in the first service, it's a true story. I didn't know I had a bald spot until some knucklehead in this crowd took a picture from the back and put it on social media. And I went to my wife, I said, Sylvia, look at this. I didn't know I was bald. She, why didn't you tell me? She said, why would I, true story, why would I tell you that? <laughs> what was I saying? Let's go back. Okay, here we go. Don't be this guy. Don't be like everybody. Don't be like the majority. Be this guy. Be a transformer. Right? Be somebody different that, that God uniquely created you to be. You've heard me say this over and over, okay? If you've, if you've just gone through a major change in your life, whether that's a devastating loss, whether it's a relationship breakup, whatever that it is, if you've just gone through a major change in your life, you shouldn't make any big decisions for at least a year. I'm talking about big life-changing decisions. Don't buy a new car. Don't move. Uh, don't make any new investments. Just, just hit the pause button and slow this thing down. There's just some things you shouldn't do. You don't go to the grocery store when you're hungry. You better have more than a debit card if you do that. You don't go to the grocery store when you're hungry and you don't make big life decisions. Listen to me now. You don't make big life decisions when you've just walked out of the emotional emergency room that has left you busted, bruised, bloodied, and battered. You just don't do it. You need to strip off the old before you can put on the new. Renew your mind. It's going to take, take time. time. Oh, lot of precious time. It's going to take patience and time. Mm, to do it, 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 to do it right, child. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Whatever it takes, I have no pride. Whatever it takes to make the point, I'll use George Harrison if I have to. My favorite Beatle. The Apostle Paul nailed it. He said, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of, of your mind. Have you noticed whenever that I say something really harsh that people don't like, I'll always try to lighten the moment. Because I want you to love me. You know why that I give out lollipops to these beautiful little girls of yours? Because I want them to like me. Yes. So you be kind to people and maybe they'll lean in a little bit. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then look at the promise. Let's progress through this real quickly. Then you will be able. There it is. Then you will be able. This is amazing. To test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Okay? Do you want to know what God's will for your entire life is? Paul says, well, then make, take some time to renew your mind. Uh, this is why you need to be in church, I believe, pretty much every single Sunday. I know there's exceptions, and I know you're busy and you have other options, but you need to find a church where the Scripture is taught in practical and applicable ways. You don't have to go to this church. You know, I understand everybody doesn't like the way we do churches, so you don't have to come here. But our services, you know, sometimes they're too short for some people. You may want a longer service and shorter sermons. You're not going to get that here. But you need to find a church. You need to find a church where every single week people are talking about things that maybe you're not thinking about just so that it challenges you to renew your mind. Now, I want to run through some of the stuff that keeps us from answering the questions as I try to wind this down. I've got a little time to finish this up without rushing. But what, what is it that keeps us from answering the question, what was I thinking? Because there's, some seven, there's about seven deadly assumptions that keep us from processing this correctly. And I want to break these down for you and talk about them real quickly, each one. And we'll start with number one. If I find the right person, everything will be all right. Mm-hmm. PT, the last relationship didn't work out because he was an idiot. But if I find a non-imbecile, non-moronic fool, I can make it work. I can make it work. Why did you date an idiot the first time around? What were you thinking? If you haven't figured that out, guess what's going to happen? You're going to land with another idiot the second time around. 
This is not about finding the right person. Follow me now. This is not about finding the right person. This is about you becoming the right person. Amen. It's about you becoming the right person. You've not changed, and and that's going to carry over into your next relationship. It's not about finding the right person. It's about being the right person. The right person you are looking for is not looking for you because you hadn't fixed some things yet. So quit looking for the right person and become the right person. Renew your mind. Number two, my situation's unique. Deborah, you're going to like this. Pay attention. No, it's not. This is why there are counselors who will never be without a job. That's right. When you go see a doctor and tell him what your symptoms are, he diagnoses your problem and writes you a prescription to treat that problem. He does that pretty quick. He assesses where you're at and what's going on, and he he hits you with that prescription. Not because your body is unique. It's not. He's already seen thousands of people over the course of his career with the exact same symptoms and problems that he just diagnosed that you had and treated them the same way. He knew exactly how to treat your pain because your body is not unique. It's like everybody else's body, okay? All the parts are in the same place, mostly. Your heart, your fingers, your toes, your knees, and we'll stop there. But guess what? Your situation is not unique either. It's just not. Your assumption that your situation is unique is your attempt to dodge your responsibility of doing the right thing and ignoring wise counsel. Well, that won't work for me. My situation is unique. No, it's not. It's not unique. This is why I'm not a good counselor. For years and years, people would come into my office and they'd tell their unique story and their circumstances, and I'd give them good advice. I'd give them good advice and good counsel. And they'd push back, and they'd say, well, Pastor, you don't understand. That's not going to work for me. My situation is unique, and that might work for everybody else, but it's not going to work for me. And I'm like, they'd leave my office, and I, I'm like, oh, sweet Jesus. These people are so stupid, Lord. I just don't have the, I don't have the patience to be a great counselor. Your story is not unique. Different names, different characters, same story since the beginning of time. Quit lying to yourself and take time to renew your mind. Third thing, it may be wrong, but it makes me happy. Doesn't God want me to be happy? No! (laughs) What do you base that on? Well, I just assume, you know, he's God. He would want me to be happy. God's not as concerned with your happiness as what you tend to, to believe. So your theme song is, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. And you just believe that God sent His Son Jesus to the cross so you could be happy, regardless of whether or not your choices are right or wrong. Whether you make good choices or or bad choices, good decisions or bad decisions. Well, I, I know it's not legal, but it makes me happy. I'm done with that one. We're just going to move on, okay? Number four, if I could just get, if I could just get, If I could just get one more, if I could just have, if I could just go, if I could just do this, if I could make this, I would be happy. If I could just, if I could just, then I would be satisfied. Let me me give you an example. How many of you in the room, and don't be bashful, how many of you in the room have tattoos? Raise your hand. Okay, that's a lot of folks at Crosspoint have tattoos. So let, let let me just make a point. How many of you have more than one? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you only have one and you're already planning your next one? See, that pretty much takes care of most of the people that have them. See, here's the thing. Now, Micah only has one tattoo because he doesn't have any more tattoo money. (laughs) I only have one tattoo because I can't take tattoo pain. But I think about it, you know. I'll I'll see something. I say, that'd be cool. I'd like to get that scripture. I'm like, you know, that hurt. I ain't doing that. I ain't doing that. Most people get more than one because for them, one is not enough. I just want one more, and I'm done. No, you're not. No, you're not. And you know it. Here, here's the thing that you need to understand. Appetites are never fully and finally satisfied. I've taught this principle at Cross Point for 10 years. Appetites are never fully and finally satisfied. The whole idea that if I could just get, if I could just have, if I could just buy, then I'll be satisfied. That's just not true. It's not true. 
No appetite, whether it's an appetite for a new car, new clothes, a new nose. Anything new. A new anything. No appetite is fully and finally satisfied ever. Once you get whatever it is you want, you're going to want something else. And I'm okay with acquisition. I am. I'm okay with acquisition. I'm okay with buying stuff and purchasing stuff. It's good for the economy. I change trucks about as often as I change underwear, it seems, here lately. Like once a month. Well, the underwear is a joke, sort of. The truck, maybe not so much. But here's my point. You need to quit lying to yourself. Don't fool yourself into thinking, once I get whatever I want, then I'm going to be satisfied. No, you will not. Because appetites are never fully and finally satisfied, go ahead and lease it, go ahead and buy it, go ahead and rent it, but don't lie to yourself about it. Don't lie and tell your, your spouse, well, if you just let me have this, I promise I won't never ask for it. Get out of here. You know, you know that ain't happening. Once I have it, I'm done. It's just not true. If you feed an appetite, an appetite will grow. Feed it and it grows. It's never going to be fully, completely, totally satisfied. So, so just keep that on, on you know, front and center at, when you get ready to make another big life decision. You're not going to satisfy an appetite. Number five, I just need a fresh start with someone new. I just need a fresh start with someone new. I'm going to say this, and it's going to, you know, because it's true. Some of you give up way too soon. You give up way too soon. And you don't necessarily need someone new every single time. Well, she just doesn't meet my needs anymore. He doesn't meet my needs anymore. I need to find someone who can meet all of my needs. And I'm, I'm listening to this, and I'm going, what is wrong with this culture and this society? And I've already said it once, but I need to repeat it again. You will never find the right person until you become the right person. Philippians chapter 2, let me teach you a real quick Bible principle. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider the other better than yourself. Each of you should look not to your own needs, but also on the needs of others. When I do pre-marriage counseling, which is not very often anymore, I usually farm all that stuff out, but I help couples discover what the top, top five most important needs are, not for them, but of their spouse. And a lot of you, I had some guys come up to me after, after church today and they showed me their laminated card that I gave, presented to them during their wedding ceremony. I said, Pastor, I still got it, I'm still working on it. So I, I had, you know, here, here's kind of how it goes. In pre-marriage counseling over the course of about four weeks, I help them discover what's the five most important needs that they have and I do that not for them, I do that for their spouse. Because during the ceremony, I look at the bride and I say, you know, we, we've discovered what the five most important needs are in your life. You're holding that laminated card in your hand. I want you to now take that and present it to your groom. And when she gives him her five most important needs, I look at him and I say, for the rest of your life, you're to focus not on your needs, but on the needs that are on that list. And every four or five years... Do the assessment again and figure out, because, you know, as we get older, needs change, right? And as we get older, needs change. And I'll say every four or five years, you take the books that I'm giving you and all the resources, and you figure out what her needs are again. And then I tell him, I said, now hand her your card. And he hands her his laminated card. And I tell her, for the rest of your life, your goal, your objective is to spend your life not trying to get your needs met, but trying to meet his. And let me tell you something, ladies. You folk, and it, this goes both ways. You focus on meeting the needs on that laminated card, and he will follow you around like a bulldog on a chain <laughs> to do whatever you want him to do. You don't even have to ask. What you need, baby? What you need? Can I get you something? Same, it goes both ways. Because God created us not to be sponges and takers. He created us to be givers. And when you start focusing on the needs of others, you become a generous person. You begin to live a generous lifestyle. Not only will your home be blessed, but your marriage, your relationship, your children, every element, every sphere of your life will be blessed because you became a generous, giving person. So it's got to happen. And, and, you know, if I could just find somebody new, you need, to, you need to be somebody new. If you come to my office someday and, and you tell me she no, no longer meets your needs... I'm going to slap the taste right out of your mouth. Because you just admitted that you're more focused on your needs than you are on hers. And you're self-centered, vain, and conceited. 
If you want love that'll last a lifetime, spend the rest of your life meeting her needs. And if you want love that'll last a lifetime, you need to spend the rest of your life meeting his needs. Figure this out. Be the right person. Don't go find the right person. Be the right person. Now, there's a great book that I use as a, a source for pre-marriage counseling. You need to pick it up. I usually keep a bunch of copies, and somehow I've given them all away. But it's called His Needs, Her Needs, and it's by Willard F. Harley. And it's a timeless classic that you need to, to dive into if you're struggling. Number six, number six, and we're getting close to being done. My secret is safe with me. My secret is safe with me. No, it's not. It's not safe with you. First of all, secrets are bad and unhealthy. And if you're a single or, or you're, you know, if you're a single person or you're single again, please hear what I'm about to say. When you take your secret into a new relationship, it never remains a secret. Sooner or later, it surfaces. You just break hearts when it finally does come to the top. Your secret is not safe with you because secrets seep into your most important relationships. What's down in the well comes up in the bucket. Amen? You and your spouse and your secret alcohol addiction is a broken home waiting to happen. Somebody's eventually, or something, or somebody's eventually got to go. You and your spouse and your secret prescription drug addiction uh, is a recipe for a broken home and something or someone has got to go. You, your spouse, and your secret porn addiction, something or someone will have to go. It's not going to work and you can't keep it covered. Secrets are not safe with you because secrets seep. What's down in the well comes up in the bucket. Let's finish with a bang. And I thought, how can I finish strong and really, you know, have an impact? The seventh assumption with devastating conclusions is number seven, sex will solve it. Now, if you don't send your children, if you don't send your children to Kids Point or to the nursery, this is your fault, it's not mine. This is an adult environment, and I'm going to talk to you like adults. People say sex will solve it. Sex will not solve it. Sex will complicate it. It will complicate it. The minute you think, well, you know what? If I just sleep with him, the minute you think if I can just get her to sleep with me, in the back of your mind, you think that sex is a problem solver. And, and again, can we just be adults here for a moment? Listen, God is not against sex. You need to understand that. God created sex. Yay, God! <laughs> right? It's amazing. It's like, oh, God looks around heaven. He goes, hey, I got a great idea. And the angels are like, what? And God's like, well, you won't get it. Literally, you're never going to get it. <laughs> but it's the best idea I've ever had. Come on. Sex isn't designed to solve anything. Most of you in this room have lived long enough to know that sex, especially outside of God's divine design and intention, doesn't solve your problems. But it certainly has the potential to complicate your life. So here's the question that you've got to answer before moving on. What was I thinking? What was I thinking? What were you thinking? It's not enough to ask the question. You've got to take time to figure it out. You need to slow this thing down called life and answer that question. Don't rush into the next season of your life until you've taken time to answer that question. In fact, until you come up with an answer to this question, don't start anything new. Don't jump back in until you've taken off the old and put on the new. You're never going to get to where you want to go. The next time is going to look an awful lot like the last time, and it's going to peel away again if you don't take time to renew your minds. Don't be like this guy. See, he's already fallen down. Don't be like this guy. Because everybody, the majority is like that, right? Be like this guy, our pretend transformer today. Be like him, right? Be the uniquely created person that God intended and wanted you to be. Don't conform, transform. The good news is this. Next time really can be better than the last time. If you will take the time to renew, restore, and reset the right way, would you bow your heads for prayer? Dear Jesus, here's what I know. Because we're people, and people tend to have a lot of problems. Because of that, this sermon has landed hard for a lot of people in this room. In fact, I think that it probably got down in the weeds of someone's life, and maybe it was hard for them to sit here and listen to this sermon today. But I pray that they would have the courage to sit in the weeds 
to hang out there long enough to renew their mind, to be restored by stripping away all those painful layers and figure out their part in the mess that was made from the last season of life before they step into the next season of life. Not blaming anyone else, but assessing our part in the debacle. Taking personal responsibility. Let them sit in the weeds until something changes, until they realize they're part of the the flop, the failure, the fumble. And Father, I pray for them as, as they now reset. I ask that you help them to be... Help them to be certain to not try to smuggle any of their personal dysfunction into the next season of their lives. But to strip that all away during this season of taking time to figure out, what was I thinking? Let us determine in our hearts, dear God, to not be like the majority and to conform. But, oh, Father, let us become the unique people that you created us to be, transformed into your image. And we pray all of these things in the matchless the beautiful, the holy name of Jesus.